Covert intelligence involves a lot of waiting around. Any meeting, any appointments, you have to show up early, make sure you're not followed, make sure the area is secured, check out the other guy's advance team, and see how well he is prepared. It's good trade craft, but it's like hanging around in your dentist reception area 24 hours a day. You read magazines, sip coffee, and every once in a while, someone tries to kill you. I'm Eddie Webb. And I'm Chris Spivey. And today we're going to watch all of the voiceovers that occur in Burn Notice. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of Genreless. And no, this is not at all a Doctor Who episode by any stretch of the imagination. I can't even pretend it's a Doctor Who episode. Uh, we are taking a break because we have learned from season three that we need to do this to avoid burning out on long runs. Covert operations occasionally teaches you that you need to take a break from other things to make sure that you can retain your focus to be able to <laughs> act at a moment's notice, yet avoid endless boredom. <laughs> When you're a spy pretending to be a podcaster, you realize a few things. <laughs> that's that's the show, right? That's for notice in a nutshell. Is Michael Weston explaining things to you like you're five years old? <laughs> as as I like to give occasional Jill walkbys, there there is even one for burn notice. Oh, no. There there are two actually, because as Eddie knows, I watch these episodes this week. And for us, this week means I watch them over the course of two nights and I'm recording one of them the next morning because time is a thing that I still wish I had. Yeah. So the first night I popped down, I watched the first two, like the first two episodes back to back and Jill had some free time and she was wandering by, she sat down doing something and she was there for about 15, 20 minutes. Like, You're laughing a lot at this show. It's like, I am because the pilot is hilarious. Yes. And I saw it when it first came out. And I told her, yeah, we're doing it for the podcast. It's a show I watched when it first came out. And it has like lots of funny bits. Then last night, she comes, she walks by and says, this is the cheesiest show. Why are you watching this? <laughs> so from humor to absolute cheese at the bottom within three episodes. And so we haven't done this in a while like the our kind of our context with the show but i found this show kind of by accident honestly right like um uh the, the context was i i had had uh inner ear surgery um i've had several of them for the course of my life because my ears are a train wreck and so i like had about two weeks of medical leave and i was one of the downsides of the surgery was that I had constant uh, vertigo because my inner ear had been messed with. So my, my body had to readjust to a new balance. So I was basically stuck on the couch for, for several days. Uh, and I just was looking for something to watch. Like, and so like, this is when I actually had cable cable. Uh, and so for, uh, in, an episode of burn notice came on. I, kind of like seen ads for it but didn't really know much about it and i was like oh hey bruce campbell's in this that this looks fun so i pulled up i think it was netflix at the time had it <laughs> um and so i just started binging it uh and i will say binging it while you're half out of your head on pain meds is probably the best way to experience this show <laughs> i watched it when it first came out week to week and i even started with the first episode because i saw it was a show that had bruce campbell in it and i was like mm -hmm. I'm still a, to this day i'm still a huge bruce campbell fan so then i was a bigger yeah. bruce campbell fan and i was like bruce campbell's in the show i'm gonna watch it mm -hmm. and you know I, I did the the so acting was you know acting I am more impressed by the lead whose name eludes me at the moment, but I saw that he gives a lot to charity. He donates much of his time and he even went out and gave like a hundred thousand dollar scholarship to, it was like a, a university or something where they give $10,000 a year to the winner of it to help them get them started. Like incredibly wow. generous stuff that I saw that he was doing. And I am impressed by that. So I will Jeffrey have nothing, Donovan. but thank you primarily positive things to say about Jeffrey Donovan coupled with the fact that he has been an, a professional martial artist for like 20 or 30 years. And I don't want to get on that guy's bad side. So yeah, like 
I, I mean, I, I, I was joking at the beginning, like, partially because it's such a tonal shift from watching Doctor Who, right? This is USA Network, and for people listening who aren't familiar with that, USA Network is, is a is a basically a, a standard cable network in the U.S. Uh, and they were and they made a lot of relatively cheap content akin to like the CW in some ways. You, you, my friend, are forgetting what USA Network was at this time. Okay. This is like Rhonda Shear up all night. This is like the Silk Stocking show. This is where they would show the cheesy B, B screen movies from like the 80s with Linnea Quigley and everything else after 11 to midnight. This is the USA that we're talking about, the USA that we're talking about right now. Not. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, this, this is, this is a network that like, uh, put a lot of money into uh, um, WWE Raw, you know. Like, I mean, this is they, they were they were they were really just throwing a lot of darts at the wall around this point when they got burn notice. I think shortly after burn notice, because it became a huge success, they started investing in other shows, kind of like burn notice. So, if, like, there's a few years where USA Network became reasonably good television. Isn't this where Suits came from? Yes, I think so. <laughs> and so, like. But but yeah, we're not quite. We're, this is uh, 2007, so like we're just not. I think it's around 2010 where USA Network has a brief run of, of genuine quality uh, work, and and then that was before streaming originals became where all the money kind of shifted to. So we're 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 in a way seeing kind of a, a glimpse into that viewpoint. But you're absolutely right. Like it's genuinely well cast like like this is a show that uh is all about the character right it, it, it's it reminds me a bit in a lot of ways of sleepy hollow in the sense of the, the premise is a little wonky and if you think about it too hard it starts to fall apart and over time the show kind of <laughs> starts to realize the premise doesn't hold up but the characters are just fantastic and the actors are really doing what they can with the characters and, and i think it's a lot of reasons why you keep watching it and I think that something of sort of a future point for the show, though, is it I'm going to give it the credit. I didn't read it up or look it up, but to realize that by the end of third season going to fourth season that they needed to shake up the cast. So they added in a new cast member mm -hmm. and the new cast member they added in was a person of color to show that they might have realized that, well, maybe we need to, like, address our all white cast that we yeah. have here. Let's make a conscious effort to do something different. And like that's a show that course corrected itself, which I yes. think is a huge thing. And yeah. Jesse Porter, I think, was a decent character of memory service because I, I watched it when it came yeah. out. I did not rewatch the show, but added a different energy and was antagonistic and eventually I think becomes friendly with everyone else that's there. So it's a good even character growth for that character to go with these characters on their own journey. Right. Uh, you're absolutely right. Like one of the things uh, on some level, Burton, okay, so. In case you're not familiar with it, uh, really briefly recap that the show will tell you every single episode what the premise is. What is that Michael Weston was a spy um, who basically was fired in the middle of a job, but what in the industry is apparently called a burn notice, uh, and therefore was forced to stay in Miami. He was basically dumped in Miami, and because he was a spy, he has no documentation of who he is, uh, so he can't leave Miami because he has no passport, no driver's license, nothing. And it uh, happens to be where his family and some of his friends are living, and that's why the show is primarily set in Miami. So the 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 arc is Michael Weston trying to find out who burned him, why, and then get revenge, which over seven seasons, that promise doesn't hold up. But to your point, you're right. Around season three, they realized it was getting thin, it was getting popular. And so uh, spoilers for later seasons, but Michael eventually does get his burn notice uh, re uh, to return. He goes back to working for the CIA for a while, uh, and Jesse Porter is kind of on the other side of that relationship because it's like, hey, this guy was burned. Why is he now given better treatment than, than people like me? And so he has a genuine beef with uh, uh, Michael Weston and, again, becomes a really compelling, cool character. Uh, but you're right. This is 2007 USA Network they were primarily hiring white people. Um, so uh, mm -hmm. it, it, you're going to see that a lot in this show. The people of color are in positions of servitude primarily. Um, so it's, it's, it's a little uncomfortable, but this, you're right. The show does recognize that and do better. Well, 
the being dumped. Can I say that being dumped in Miami is a great city to be dumped in if that's where you're expected to live and figure out what you're Oh, yeah. Do. It's not like being dumped in some podunk no name town in Nebraska. All right, buddy. Right. There you go. Figure it out. Yeah, Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> Having recently been to. <laughs> no, I didn't say Cleveland because I know you've become a recent fan of Cleveland. Um, uh, I am. I've got a book. I've got some books on Cleveland. I may be reading up on Cleveland for a, a side project. Who knows with me? I'm, I'm reading a lot of books these days. I could be working on a bunch of projects or I could just be reading to be reading. Exactly. I used to live near Cleveland, so I have opinions about Cleveland. But and uh, Eddie was uh, blowing me up in the Discord when in our in our private Discord, like, "Hey, look at this great thing in Cleveland." He's like, "Fuck Cleveland! Fuck you for being in Cleveland! Fuck this! Fuck!" This. It's like Eddie, call with the profanities, my friend. Fuck Eddie! Fuck! Fuck! So, <laughs> if you say Cleveland around Eddie, be very careful and be ready for a <laughs> bunch of f bombs, or as they say in Wrexham, enthusiasm. <laughs> enthusiasm. <laughs> I actually ran a Vampire the Masquerade game in Cleveland. It was it was a lot of fun because it was like, you know, you have one square block of something because nobody else wants it. You're a bunch of new mates. Here you go. <laughs> uh, anyway, but yes, you're right. The the show, one of the things I love about the show is like it, it, it's a super spy drama, but it's like, what if a super spy is, quote unquote, on the down and outs, except for... Mike Weston's life for an undocumented person is surprisingly glamorous. Even he has no money. <laughs> Once again, he is white. Right. And right, that brings exactly. you a certain level of status that is assumed, even if it's not backed up by anything. You you could ask former tyrannical presidents who don't really have a billion dollars who say that they do are given all this grace to run around and do shenanigans. Right. Exactly. Did I just make our podcast political? Oh God, no! Not this podcast. <laughs> not every single episode. That you don't make it. We make it. We we have opt- we've chosen this path together. I like that. But no, so there's that given to him, and plus you even get. You, we'll, we'll probably we should get into the episode proper before we go into that. Never mind. I'll pause on that. Fair enough. Is there anything that we want to talk about surrounding Burn Notice itself before we get into the episode about USA about the actress that plays Fiona? about the actor that plays Sam is that if I don't remember certain people's name, I'm going to call everyone by their character name. I remember right. Bruce Campbell's name, but I'm going to give everyone the grace of acting like I don't because Bruce Campbell, in my opinion, is the biggest name for the show. <laughs> the one thing uh, I want to mention, we, di- we didn't cover it. And-, and maybe at some point I would like to go back and do so is that Sam X, the one that Bruce Campbell plays end up being a, a breakout star and we're not going to cover it in the episodes we're going to see but sam has a genuinely heartbreaking uh character arc in this show and to the point where he actually got his own film called the fall of sam x in 2011 um which jeffrey donovan who plays michael weston actually directed uh so this is an it, it, it again. It's it's a show that really commits to its characters in a lot of ways, and to the point where it recognizes, okay, this character is really interesting. Let's see where this goes. And there really aren't many dud characters. Uh, um, the, the FBI agents we'll talk about maybe a little bit, but but most of the characters are are just genuinely cool. Um, so if you're watching this for kind of let's watch interesting characters and have kind of a episode of the week plots for michael donovan to to plow through with extremely dodgy science uh then this is an amazing show uh if you're expecting the plot of michael getting revenge on the agency to be wrapped up in anything resembling a fast pace that will not happen you mean it's almost like the legends where they just put a bunch of actors enjoying themselves on screen yes. and they just kind of wait and see what happens yes yes before we go, though, I have to I have to give out a shout out to I think she is Cagney who plays the mom from yes. the show Cagney and Lacey, who is a was a huge name, but I think by about time this came out is still somewhat known and popular. But as I said, Bruce Campbell is like the big name for the show, and I think I still hold I hold to that opinion. But well, yeah, Cagney yeah, I, mean, Lacey. I, 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 it's interesting because like uh, a lot of the actors are people who either were not names or just good actors or who were names for actors. And so watching their careers posts and watching their various trajectories, it has been interesting. 
but you're absolutely right. It's good you mentioned Legends because I hadn't thought about that, but you're right. It is kind of that same energy of just let's just put some fantastic people on screen who were genuinely charismatic and clearly having fun, and let's just keep doing that for as long as we can. And I know, and as you mentioned, it just from how the show itself is structured, there are a lot of other shows that feel like this, but they don't have the same swagger is not the right word, but the the charisma of it. Like I really liked John Doe. Mm-hmm. But John Doe had good acting and had a similar vibe, but was a more serious in tone. Right. And he kept to yeah. its more story arc. Well, this didn't. And this ran I, seven seasons. John Doe ran one. <laughs> well, I think part of that is the fact that John Doe was trying to be the born identity from a spy who's been dismissed. This is James Bond, if he had been American and dismissed, <laughs> right? So... Michael Weston is a super spy stuck in a cast of people who are not super spies. And that's part of the fun of the show is Michael Weston can do everything better than you. Uh, and one of the things – I'll talk about this in the first episode, but one of the things Jeffrey Donovan does, I think, is really plays both of those levels really, really well. Since you mentioned it, I have to do it. If I remember properly, the first James Bond – the first – televised James Bond was in fact an American because it's played by an American actor. Woody Allen. Yes, I know. No, no. This is like a black and white movie or TV series. God, it's been too long. I oh, really? It. Yeah. And it was like, they kind of took the name and popped it on somebody. If I remember right now, now I'm going to have to go back and read up, read up on it. So if we ever do James Bond, I could talk about this specific thing, but and you're right. American actor, Barry Nelson. Thank you. Eddie is wow. cheating with Google Foo in the background. Yes, yes. I, I am, I am pulling stuff search. from the dregs <laughs> of my mind at like the wee hours of the morning and Eddie cheats. I want people to know that. Professionalism equals cheating. Yes. Also, my memory is terrible, so that's why I do it. All right. Let's go into episode one because obviously there's a lot to talk about that really makes more sense to talk about the episode. All right. Uh, so episode one, uh, season one, episode one, pilot. While on assignment in Nigeria, covert operative Michael Weston learns that he has been burned. For a spy, it is the equivalent of being fired. A burned spy is blacklisted from all government agencies and resources. His bank accounts are frozen and his credit is trashed. Michael barely escapes Nigeria and wakes up battered in a motel in Miami, Florida. In order to survive and fund his own personal investigation, Michael enlists the help of his only two friends that he has, Fiona Glennan, who's an ex-IRA operative who also happens to be an ex-girlfriend, and Sam Axe, a washed-out military intelligence contact who's been under surveillance by the FBI. He's also forced to deal with the family he went halfway around the world to get away from, particularly his mother, Madeline Weston, who could not be happier to have her son back in town. Through former spy turned security consultant Lucy Chen, whom Michael helped learn the trade, he gets a lead on a small investigation job. A caretaker of an estate, Javier, is accused of stealing valuable art from his employer, Graham Payne, played by the amazing Ray Wise. Uh, all evidence points to it being an inside job, and Javier, who little, very little money to offer, is nowhere else to turn. When Michael begins to dig around, he discovers that was in fact an inside job. Payne orchestrated the robbery and framed Javier in order to collect the insurance. Michael confronts Payne with decriminating evidence. Uh, when Payne and his bodyguard come after Javier and his son, Michael's already stepped ahead of them and has set up a trap at Javier's house. After the smoke clears, Payne has accidentally shot his bodyguard, and Michael's enough evidence sent both of them to jail for conspiracy to commit kidnapping. With the mounting evidence hanging over his head, Payne agrees to clear Javier's name and provide financial support to Javier and his son in perpetuity. Meanwhile, Michael keeps trying to get in touch with his old government hander, Dan, Dan Seibels, who will not accept his calls. Deciding to get creative, Michael resorts to mailing Sybils a fake bomb in order to get his attention. The play works, and Michael finally gets to confront Sybils about the burn notice. Uh, Sybils believe Michael has probably been framed. There's nothing to do to help him, but he still has allies from the agencies, at least for now. Uh, he tells Michael not to leave Miami unless he wants an FBI manhunt after him. To top it all off, Michael returns home to find his door open and the floor covered with surveillance photos. It is not the FBI, but whoever it is, they have been tracking his every move, and they have left a brochure which has the cover that says, Welcome to Miami. So, you, How could this recap not include the most important character in the entire piece, Eddie? <laughs> Please enlighten me, Chris. You left out Sugar. The most important part of the entire pilot. <clears throat> mean vanilla ice. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Weston's words, not mine. 
uh, no, before we talk about sugar, I want to talk about Fiona's accent. Uh, it's spot on, right? It disappears after this pilot, not because it is spot on, because it is both god awful and the actor did not want to keep doing it. <laughs> Speaking of politics, <laughs> briefly, Fee is ex IRA. And how the IRA are portrayed in American media versus how they're perceived in European media and believe how they're even perceived by the Irish is deeply complicated. It is in some ways surprising that someone who is all but called a terrorist is actually a star character in a show post 9-11. But because she is IRA and America kind of turns away from some of the excesses the IRA have done – we get into this complex muddy muddiness. Uh, to the show's credit, we since learned that she is ex IRA because she turned on the people that used to she used to work with, uh, and they do show the IRA in a less than flattering light throughout the course of the show. But initially, it is not at all clear that is the case, um, and indeed, the show kind of walks up to the line of saying the IRA are the good guys, which is complicated and unfortunate. Do I need to tell you what else, though, that Fee has going for her? Which is what? She is a very attractive white woman. So on the show, that gives in and of itself a lot of <clears throat> a lot of leeway for how they can engage the character to be a primary lead on the show. It is not – they would oh, not sure, have sure. a a black – terrorist or black former terrorist being a lead on the show running around with Michael. Well, right. I mean, that, 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 that's, that's, that's the, the crux of it, right? Like it's <clears throat> again, America has a complicated relationship with, with the IRA and life comes down to it's the, Oh, uh, well, ultimately they're white. And so therefore it, we accept that there's nuance here. Whereas if they're not, we don't always accept the nuance there. And I'm reinforcing this specifically because the opening scenes show Michael pretty much Kicking black people's asses who are equivalent, I think, portrayed at least by the show to be terrorists working for a white, white terrorist. Like that is the opening scenes for the show that we get to show the people that he's involved with. And these are bad guys compared to Fee, who is going to be one of our pr- protagonist heroes. Right, right. Yes. The one thing I will say in the show's credit is that um, we ha- we have watched shows which have been set in places like Africa or the Middle East and has surprisingly a high number of white people. They actually do have a large number of people. So it actually looks like he is in Nigeria. So at least on that front, uh, that the casting was, was better than some sh- equivalent shows of the time period. Um, but you're right. It, it's, it is still pretty hella awkward, especially because how he but paints not- Nigeria is, is a little yeah. uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. But not to detract from your actual points about how the IRA represented everything else, but I'm. Yeah. Yeah. No, my, from my perspective, that is a reason why they felt they could do that so easily, in addition to what you were saying. Right, right. Uh, but I mean, so, but more, uh, especially for people um, who live in the UK or Ireland, burn notice might be, have some very uncomfortable connotations because of, of, of Fiona. So I want to mention that at least. Uh, also, if you are uncomfortable with a narration, I mean, that's the show, right? This is a lot of voiceover. It It is the ultimate noir trope turned up to 11. Spinal Tap would be impressed by how well they broke that needle. That is how high they, they, they went with their narration. But at the same time, I, even as we're watching it, I was thinking to myself, if you're a gamer and you haven't watched Bird Notice, you should at least watch the pilot to piece together better ways for your crew to pull off jobs and do things. Okay, thank you for saying that because I remember even watching it at the time going, this is the closest we're going to get to a Shadowrun television show. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of what happens in Bird Notice, I have done some version of when I have played Shadowrun or Cyberpunk 2020. <laughs> yes. Like, oh. And, I mean, I joke about the narration, but honestly, I do think it's one of the reasons why the show persisted because what it does is not – Michael is not an unbiased narrator, and the show recognizes that. So all the narration is done from Michael Weston's perspective. Michael Weston is absolutely the viewpoint character. And so 
uh, even things like when he is talking about uh, uh, where he's at or what he's talking about all comes from the perspective of someone who is a cynical, jaded spy. Uh, and when he does his let me explain the science of what I'm doing things, uh, it is literally tell, don't show. But it does mean that sometimes we have moments where what Michael is narrating and we see on the screen are slightly at odds. And that's usually very fun. <laughs> So, like for example, when he is talking about uh, what you know, how horrible Miami is, while the show is cutting to like beaches and people in bikinis and sunsets, and I'm like, it, the show is recognizing, okay, <laughs> these things are not always going to line up, and I actually really appreciate that's what the show is doing. It's like the narration is a way for us to get to Michael Weston's head and recognizing that what Michael Weston's saying is going to generally be true, but not universally true. Uh, and I think that's uh, really important, especially when we get into things like why he got burned and, and his reactions to things. Like, so for example, the scene where he is, where he, where he literally, the scene where he gets burned itself, right? Where we see Michael Weston acting like he is terrified and weedy and slimy. But the narration is clarifying, no, 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 I'm just trying to get out of here alive. Uh, and so it allows, it allows uh, Jeffrey Donovan to really embody the, the roles he's playing as a spy, whereas we as the audience are always clear into what Michael Weston is trying to do. And I think that really helps because so many, quote, unquote, spy media, the spy ends up not acting much like a spy. And so the, narr the narration, while a bit heavy handed, actually does allow us to – keep our investment in Michael while allowing the actor to do things like, you know, try to suck up and get his ass kicked by a bunch of terrorists. <laughs> Watching the pilot though, did make me want to go and watch MacGyver if I had time just to see how <laughs> that did a similar beat with someone constantly using everyday devices to handle spy slash overly stressful combat situations. Yeah. And again, I think it's another part of the, the charms because Michael is burned and has no money. He always has to improvise things. So yeah, there's definitely a strong MacGyver DNA in, in, in the show as a whole. But also it, it, it does something – I don't want to call it clever because it's not, uh, but it is satisfying, I guess is the best word, because you're going to see nonsense on the screen, and then Michael Weston explains it, and you go, okay, I, I now accept this. You, yes, you say it's not clever, but I, I'm going to say that I think it is clever because one of the things we've constantly pointed out in a lot of shows is that they try to tell us something so they can cover themselves when they do it. The twist here is they acknowledge what they're doing. They let you know they're going to do it to get your investment and buy in to do it for you. Like, I think that is a clever twist. It's, it is not, oh, what's the right word? It's not ingenious, but I think it's clever and direct. And they do it right away, so that builds that trust with you. And so you're more invested in Michael's journey. That's fair. Like another example is the narration I actually read at the start of the episode. Um, it's talking about how boring surveillance is, and yet almost immediately afterwards, a chase breaks out, right? Um, if you didn't have that narration, you would seem like Michael's life is constantly exciting. And so he is there to reinforce, no, no, no. It's a lot of hard work. You have to make hard choices. It's uncomfortable. You you have to make sometimes bad decisions. So the the, the, the show can do, frankly, excessive, ludicrous, super spy stuff while Michael keeps – Michael's narration does keep that grounded. And if anyone that has done surveillance will tell you, it is very boring. It, it is Very, dull. very, very boring. Not that I have done surveillance. Not that I'm going to say that I have or haven't. Right. <laughs> Officially, I have not done that. I do so, like that. Go ahead. I like the use, while I commented negatively about them being how they treated the black people from the start of the show, I do like the use of the environment to aid in his escape. Like the motorcycle chase, everything else going through the markets. And that was a very nice touch. Yeah, I like it because it, it feels like something out of a James Bond movie, and it helps you very quickly understand, okay, this is the kind of character we're following. It, it does help that throughout the show's history, but particularly in the pilot, 
um, lots of characters refer to Michael Weston like he is some kind of legend. Um, you know, like we, you know, we we thought Michael Weston was five different people, always the same name. I think at one point it comes up in this episode. Um, and so it's like everyone thinks Michael Weston is this amazing character, but he is never given a, a, a lot of of resources. So he's always kind of scraping to get by in the, in the show. And it's always also interesting. It's like okay, he's a freelancer. Uh, when we first meet him, like he's not working for the CIA. He is an independent asset. Uh, and so that opens the question of like, if he's so good, why is he working on his own? And again, it's that he is a cynical spy. All of the other characters around him are very much not cynical people. They're all passionate in very different ways. Uh, and so Michael reacting to these very strong personalities is, again, a lot of the fun of the show because his narration – He's trying to keep cool, calm, and collected as he explains things to us as the audience. But what's happening on screen is almost never that. Mm -hmm. um, which leads me to, again, Fiona. Now, talking about Fiona as a character, where she wakes him up in a hotel room uh, and just immediately starts abusing him. <laughs> I, I'm not at all surprised. Bad breakups lead to things like that. And you could tell they had a bad breakup mm -hmm. and then did not talk afterwards at all. <laughs> and it's interesting because like a, a fair chunk of the show is the romantic tension between Michael and Fee and, you know, will they get back together or whatnot? Having them previously have been together and they're breaking up, I think actually makes that tension more interesting because so many times the show, it's like they just met and then we watched the romantic arc for the first time. No, these are people who have had that arc already. And now they're going through the much more complicated and dramatically interesting thing of reconciliation and or trying to live as people outside of that relationship. And of course, because it's drama, they're going to constantly go back and forth over that line. Uh, but these are two adults who have had a past relationship. Uh, and so again, in a very small – one thing that this pilot does is it paints these relationships very, very quickly and very, very effectively. And so yeah, it's like by the end of this – short like two or three minute section i you absolutely believe that fiona is a pissed off girlfriend and also that michael may have you know contributed a lot to how she feels and it's builds a type of relationship that runs throughout the course of the show and pretty much stays consistent to what you would expect to have happened and i agree that i think having them in a previous relationship adds additional tension because that means even if for some reason they get back together they could potentially break apart again easier because they understand the other person's foibles and they may not be as forgiving as you were if you were in a brand new relationship like you've seen this arc for this person multiple times if they're not changing now they may not change you just may all right i'm, I'm fucking done and you walk but then there's that draw that you have to bring them back together because you've already established that they have a strong connection mm -hmm. so that adds the levels of complexity that are amazing to have then you right. then you throw in sam <laughs> yeah I'm, it's like well they're the best, the best friend there is a strong argument online that has been made that Sam and Michael ha also have sexual tension. I will not untangle that particular Gordian knot, um, <laughs> but but you're right. I mean, the the, the, the from a it, however you read it, I currently still read it as platonic, but you have the same dynamic of like these are two friends who had a kind of falling out. Um, it's unclear initially what's going on. We find out throughout the course, but it's because. Well, actually, we don't find out in this episode. Um, but we do find out over over the first season that Sam's actually informing on Michael. But again, Bruce Campbell's a really good job, like because he he comes across as frankly sleazy. He's using women to get money, uh, and to have a comfortable existence. And he he he's like his his guy's just annoying. He's a sleaze bag. What does he what value does he bring to Michael? And yet, Sam clearly understands. Michael and so bizarrely Sam Max pretty quickly becomes kind of Michael's emotional center in a lot of ways. Uh -huh. There's someone who understands what's going on and it leads to one of my favorite lines. Granted it's repeated every episode, but one of my favorite lines is Michael trying to get Sam to explain you know, what's going on to help him out. And Sam is just dismissive of, of Michael because he thinks spies are just a bunch of bitchy little girls. And, 
it sells a, a, a departmental relationship and a personal relationship and Sam acts as a character in one line. It's just amazing because we just saw this guy kick a whole bunch of ass and Sam X is going, ah, you're a bunch of wimps. And I, that's, a, that's amazing. <laughs> but it also highlights their very different backgrounds. And even though they're both in the government to show that they definitely worked in different areas of the government mm-hmm. and that internal tension and strife that's always there. So like even another nice quick touch done in just a couple minutes. But to round out the cast, you bring in which I think works so well is by centering Michael around his family. Yes. To give the cynic a heart to show that while he's acting cynical, he is still a big softy on the inside. Right. And that, and I, I completely agree with you because to me, I think frankly, uh, uh, his mom is the secret sauce to burn notice as a show. Um, it's something that's not immediately apparent, but if you start watching a lot of it, because I, I mentioned after I mentioned I, started, I watched this initially because I was sick, I then moved to binging it, genuinely interested in, in the arc, and then afterwards I started watching week week, week in the last season or two. Uh, I became a fan of Burn Notice as a result of that, and a lot of it was because of her relationship with Madeline and later uh, his brother, because his family. We find out later this is untrue, but we believe for a long period of time that his family do not know what Michael does. And Michael wants to keep that information away from particularly his mother uh, because she's a hypochondriac and she worries. And so part of it is the the humor of Michael in increasingly implausible ways to try to hide what he does from his mom. But also you get these amazing moments where – Again, we see this in the in the intro, and it's repeated constantly, but it's still a good moment where Michael's trying to do surveillance. Sam's with him. Michael checks his phone, and Sam goes, your mom, and Michael just rolls his eyes behind sunglasses somehow and puts <laughs> the phone away. And I'm like, that's that's this show, right? Is the, mom, I'm trying to do super spy stuff. Please stop calling me at work. <laughs> as, as you're describing how he's constantly trying to hide what he does from his mom, you know, what superhero that parallels right almost perfectly spider-man spider-man peter yeah. and aunt may no no aunt may i'm not a superhero swinging around fighting crime and i'm thinking i'm not talking the new wave spider-man that you have with marissa tomei as aunt may which i fully support i'm talking old school sam lee i wrote this aunt may is like 106 and a leaf could kill her aunt may and you've got peter constantly trying to hide that from her you mean Aunt May? I have no idea what you are, so I'm going to secretly marry Dr. Octopus Aunt May? Yes. Yes, that <laughs> Aunt May. Well, the one thing I like about Madeline also is that she is in her own arena just as much a force of nature as Michael, right? Mm-hmm. We'll talk about more in, in a later episode. We don't see as much in, in this episode, but the fact that Michael goes from I can stand in front of my former handler and you know tell her off even though she's trying to help me and then go see my mom and get browbeaten by my mom who just wants a ride to the doctor's office shows that it shows both that mike is a michael is a very complicated character but also that madeline where where michael gets the force of will is a lot of from madeline both intentionally as in she's also this kind of person but also you can see why he flew halfway around the world to get away from her but I also think that's one of the reasons they cast. I don't know if she's Cagney or Lacey. I'm sorry. I'm going to call her Cagney. Is <laughs> cast Cagney because that also brings in a lot of her former work and characters that she played as an instant touchstone for people right. to like have that in plus her amazing acting skill. So like those are nice touches to be able to encapsulate that character to convey a lot quickly. Right. And then we get to the setup for what is going to be the formula for a lot of episodes going forward, which is, Michael ha- wants to make an iterative step on his overall exploration burn notice. Um, in order to resolve that step, he needs to take on a uh, under the table job, helping somebody out. Uh, he then performs said job, usually takes less than or not at all of the money that is being offered for various reasons. Uh, and then as a result of doing that job, it turns out to be part of a plan that allows him to then actually move one step forward in undercovering his burn notice. That's kind of the structure we're going to see in the show as a whole. And frankly, it really works. I mean, it, it's the 
strong. You have a plot of the week reason. So it's the, here's the, the, the plot that we're going to follow this week. And we have a begin, usually a, a cap on either ends of, of character stuff for the overall mythology or, or season long plot, if you will. Uh, and there's lots of room in the middle for Michael to find reasons because, again, he has nobody he can rely on except for his two friends and his mother. So he has to go back to his core cast to help him out in all of these increasingly implausible scenarios. And I believe the reason it works so well is that it takes the Robin Hood angle of him not fully accepting mm -hmm. necessarily all the money and sometimes doing jobs for free. And we need that to care about Michael. Seriously, like the, the mom, the family and all that's great. And that buys gentle interest. But if he wasn't doing very human things and showing empathy to people, we would quickly lose interest in the character. Like, for instance, that was part of the angel problem that they had to solve in the Angel TV series. Like, mm -hmm. Angel is a great character, dark and broody. He is not the character you want to follow for seven seasons. Right. Yeah. And they did that through some of the casting around him. But for this, they did that with Michael's character development himself, in addition to adding the great characters. And one of the things that... I think really helps is that because we find out very quickly that that Michael is is a spy in the sense that he is an actor. Michael can turn on the charm, uh, fake emotion very very well. And with the relationship with his mother, we see that he does do that with his family. And over time, just to realize he does occasionally use it with his friends. We're never quite sure when Michael's being sincere and when he isn't except for when the narration tells us. And sometimes when he is talking with his friends, we don't always get the narration, so we're not always sure. Certainly at, in this pilot episode, he has kind of an eye-rolling relationship with the entire cast. He's like, you know, it's the ex-girlfriend. This is the guy who's informing on me. This is my mother. And over time, all those relationships get complicated, but because of Michael, who he's, because of who Michael is, we're never 100% sure when he's actually being sincere, reconciling, helping his friends out, or if he's just doing it as part of his overall plans. And it, it helps that Michael is so charming and likable because Jeffrey Donovan is so charming and likable, but it also occasionally, sometimes Michael does things that we as the viewer are going, I don't, I don't like that. I'm curious now if uh, Joe Bernthal, the, the guy that played the Punisher, went back and watched some of Burn Notice. Because watching it now, hearing you describe it like that, I see a lot of those things in the Punisher portrayal that he did. How Frank could that. turn it on, turn it off. And a lot of the beats feel very similar, except the Punisher's a lot more violent. But right. regardless of that, I feel like that core central acting piece is there, which I think is why I personally enjoy the Punisher show so much. Like there's that connection. Right. And I think, since you mentioned Punisher, another thing that reminds me of is I think one of the reasons why Miami works the setting is because visually it's a great contrast, right? It's like you have a lot of these deep, dark, noir betrayals and, and twists and turns, and it's set across this extremely bright, colorful setting. And so, again, it'll, that, that contrast makes the show really dynamic and engaging because the characters are complicated and contrasting to each other. Again, like… We, we, yeah, Michael is the most subtle character in the show, and everybody else is variations away from Michael, from Sam Max, who Sam Max can, can occasionally be subtle, but tries not to be, to Fiona, who is a brick and doesn't understand why we can't just blow it up. I mean, so it, it's, it's, you're right. Like, it, it, all of that bombast gives. Michael Weston room to be complicated and interesting without us losing sympathy for him. And I think that's something that you're right with the Punisher, because again, all the, at least in the network show, all the characters around the Punisher are also a little bombastic. So it gives Frank Castle room to be a little nuanced inside of that space. I will make one more comic book analogy that we can move on is that Michael would then be the Punisher. Sam would be Nightcrawler. Fee and Fee would be the Juggernaut. There you go. Oh God. Yeah. Oh God. Yes. Yes. Nothing so for people that want combo connections, those are who those three characters would be. Right. But so to go to Javier and get us back on, on plot, yeah. do you recognize ha Javier? I do, but I don't know from where. Dexter. Oh, okay. All right. Amongst other yeah. things, but like that is what I instantly recognize it from was Dexter. And I loved seeing him in a more like 
sympathetic role of like the father just trying to like do their job, just trying to get by and not being the hard ass it is in Dexter. I, I liked that contrast because I didn't, I've never seen the actor do that before. So for me, that was yeah. a fun thing. And, and I mean, so it is another interesting component. Like if you are at all tapped into how this kind of media works, you know, within five minutes, what the, what the thing is, it's like, okay, the, the, the rich asshole set this all up and is throwing his illegal immigrant worker under the bus. Right. I mean, it, it, it's really clear what, what the plan is. Oh, uh, I don't think he's illegal. It is implied heavily that, that, that the authorities will come around to his family from the, the person who, who's managing all of this. This is where I guess we get sticky because he's gone in and talked to the police. And if it's illegal, the police wouldn't have let him go. And he's back in the police at a couple different times. So the police would you know have checked what? your social security I, I, numbers I, and everything I, I, else. And- I, I think I'm confusing this with another episode, which is an unfortunate downside to this because the the, the common trope of burn notice is uh, how Michael engages with the Cuban community and how the Cuban community in Miami is generally presented. So I may be confusing yeah. with another episode. Yeah. Problematic. Right. Because it, it, there's, a, there's a strong white savior narrative that emerges as a result of this. Oh, uh, yeah. Like they could have renamed the show to keep it two words, White Savior. And it would have had like the same beats throughout the entire thing unchanged. Right. But it probably wouldn't have run seven seasons. <laughs> <laughs> it probably wouldn't have gotten mass production. I don't know. 2007, I would give you half a season run of the show called White Savior. <laughs> okay, fair. All right. Uh, but I mean, to, to go back to the point is like, it's not at all confusing what the what the plot's going to be because that's not what this kind of show is it's how does michael turn this around how does michael use his skills to take out people in power which is a sympathetic viewpoint even today regardless of the 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 racial narratives to it having someone with no resources stick it to people in power and get them to to have their comeuppance is not only one of the highlights of the show, I think, but also it's kind of the, the, tr- the, the genre we're looking at here is the how a criminal can do the things that the justice system can't possibly do. Are, are we going to change this whole season? Because I don't know if we mentioned it at the top of this one, but originally I think we're, we're calling it uh, Criminals Doing Good, or we want to change it to Sticking It to the Man. Well, How do you, I mean, want, uh, how do you want to have that over- title everywhere we go? That, 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 to be fair, that, that, that's, there's an overlap, right? I mean, it, Trimmel's Do Good is ultimately a Robin Hood narrative, and Robin Hood narrative and has part of that is, although in, historically inaccurate, the idea of a poor person being able to use their skills to overpower rich people is there, right? Ooh, now I want to do a Robin Hood run. I'm going to keep that in the back of my head. Because okay, I yeah. want to sing uh, Robin Hood and Little John running through the forest. But we'll have to hold on to that one. The the venerable Ray Wise is always a joy to see. I may have stopped in the middle of it and went, Laura! <laughs> when I saw Ray Wise pop on screen. And I knew he was going to be a bad guy. I, di- I didn't remember the episode. Ray Wise popped up. It's like, that's a villain. I don't know how yet, oh, but. Oh, yeah. No, like. Even when Michael is ostensibly working together with him, like it's immediately clear to the audience, like, oh no, you're you're the villain, right? This is not where the we have talked about nuance in this show. That that is not where the show is putting its nuance, and it's the Javier's clearly innocent, the rich assholes clearly the guilty. We know where this is going. How does Michael stick it to the rich asshole? That's what this sh- episode is ultimately about. Oh, and. So I, I love the entire beats of it. It is, it is so sad. It is predictable, but yet it is that warm, cozy, predictable. It is, right? Yeah. Uh, you don't want to be – this is an area where you don't want to be complicated and nuanced, right? It's the you want that comfortable thing because you want to see Michael, frankly, do cool shit. Why I think, where I think Burn Notice particularly does well is that in the course of Michael doing cool shit, he's also developing his emotional relationships with the supporting cast. They're not separate plot lines. They're the same plot line, and that's what's interesting. And all right, one more thing, then I can probably, should probably move on in the synopsis. The reason the show works so well, and you've touched on it, is that it is forced to stay in Miami with our same characters. For mm-hmm. instance, because we could tell variations of the story about the overly skilled protagonist helping out the little helping out the little person. We could go from as problematic as it is back in the day, the Kung Fu show, 
with uh, yeah. David Carradine instead of the Bruce Lee, how it should have been. We could go to the seventies Incredible Hulk with yeah Doctor Banner walking from se- from town to town, the Lonely Man music playing. Like all those do the, the same 18. beats, but they go to different places. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like one of my favorite lines. Well, all, one of my favorite quotes will always come from the A Team. I love it when a plan comes together. Come together. To this day, mm-hmm. I quote that mm-hmm. every time something goes right. Yep. But you have those, and they're great in of themselves in pieces, but they can't hold the drama and care for the ongoing cast because they don't have them. They just go from city to city is how they change up things. Right. This leaving it in Miami is a beautiful, gorgeous city with so many different like little suburbs to it. Does all of that, but keeps it in one place. So you get to have love of everything around it. Absolutely. And as a result, relationships grow and change in a way that those other kinds of shows can't do. Like you mentioned before, Sugar, uh, one of the, the C plot, we're, a lot happens in 45 minutes. The C plot is there's a drug dealer of the uh, loft that the Michael is illegally renting from the club owner. And there's like three or four scenes of Michael very quickly confronting Sugar, uh, getting apparently clowned by sugar turns out that is not what actually happens he gets the advantage of sugar and ultimately sh- ch- 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 chases him out of the area um which basically the sugar subplot is okay this is the kind of stuff you see michael do let's quickly show you the overall structure of the episode so that way going forward you're gonna see a lot of this stuff but again sugar's not a subtle character right he he is he is <laughs> every sleazy bleach blondes early 20s annoying drug dealer who thinks he's on top of everything and he just gets schooled by michael but it's not it's earned it's not michael just i'm a super spy i'm gonna destroy you it's the michael briefly is on the back foot and then takes advantage when when michael has a chance to plan and i think that's the key to the show is that when michael has a chance to plan or michael has access to stuff that's when things go bad but if you don't michael just has to deal with the consequences and it was Amazing because it does what you're talking about. It highlights his amazing skill set. It just moves on. Perfect. When I come to the end of the first episode, as we yeah, still I mean, got honest, more. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I mean, like the actual ostensibly plot plot of the episode is kind of the least interesting part of it. I mean, Michael Michael does stuff. Uh, but yeah, we, we get to the the mysterious ends where clearly someone is surveilling him. Who's not the FBI? Um, the FBI is, is he almost One, immediately painted as a joke. I do want to point out that the reason that we get to have the empathetic Michael going forward it is an overused trope, but he connects with the son, like the young kid oh, yes. who he sees getting beat up. So you have illusions that that's what happened to Michael oh, right, when yeah. he was growing up. And so that for- forces a connection between those two where he did in the fight, but it also gives us more insight into the family life that Michael had. That is a really good point. I, I did miss over that, so thank you for bringing that up. Because you're right; that is, uh, uh, it, it does, a, it does, it works on three levels, and it's such a small scene. And like that is crucial to our development of the character. It also plays into the fact, just from the end beat, that he confronted the FBI agents and knows that Sam was informing on him. So like all those things are right there too quickly covered, and this shows the type of relationship he's going to have with the FBI. You're mm-hmm. saying. Yeah, well, and, and uh, but but yeah, I mean, so we have this kind of the the mystery at the end, which is the all the photos, the clone at the FBI, because as we saw, the FBI are basically jokes to the point where Sam Michael can walk up to them and ask for their binoculars, and they give them to him. <sighs> Actually, I want to take about that scene for a quick second because it is a classic Michael Weston move, which is he very. If you ever play a role playing game and wonder what the fast talk skill looks like. It is Michael Weston. Michael Weston has <laughs> maximized the fast talk skill because he talks so quickly about something that at a surface level seems to make sense. And then after you think about it for half a second, you go, wait a minute, you shouldn't do that. Because Michael goes up and goes, I'm not going anywhere. I'm right here. Give me the binoculars so you can see me. And there's no reason why he can't just turn around and leave with the binoculars, right? There, there's nothing stopping him from that. <laughs> I'm no longer here. You now need the binoculars, but now I have them. But they're like, uh, yeah, no, I guess that makes sense. Here are the binoculars. That, that That's Michael Weston, right? That's what he does. <laughs> so what you're telling me, though, is the FBI agents here are portrayed similar to the FBI agents. I'm sorry. 
the NSA agents from Gross Point Blank. Yes, absolutely. They're, they're, they are ridiculous caricatures. But I think that helps because we will then see much more effective government agents going forward. Yeah. Speaking of which, do you have anything else on this episode? No, we get to see uh, an eight-year-old kick the living snot out of another eight-year-old and a bunch of adults standing by watching and applauding. So take that <laughs> and consider that a good thing. That's it. That's all I got. <laughs> the show is so weird. All right. <laughs> Season one, episode seven, Broken Rules. Uh, Michael has learned his new federal agent's name, which is Jason Bly of the CSS, which is a branch of the NSA. Michael outs him in a restaurant as an intelligence agent to make him angry. Bly responds that Michael should think about what could happen, not just to himself, but to his friends and family as well. Uh, Fiona pulls up in a stolen car with illegal weapons in the trunk just as sirens start to blare in the distance. Michael and Fiona flee. Michael needs to put some cash together to help in his flight against Bly. A criminal syndicate is squeezing out merchants in a neighborhood in Little Havana, and Michael is hired by shop owner Ernie to take them out. It turns out the organization is being run by a particularly ruthless criminal, a woman named Concha. Michael adopts the persona of an unstable, boisterous, crazy criminal trying to take over control of the neighborhood. He destroys his client's store and violently attacks some of Concha's mooks. Michael is brought to meet Concha, who wants him to continue her, her plan using his methods. It turns out she's intentionally set her extortion too high for the neighborhood families and the stores because she wants to drive them out and purchase the local real estate to develop the neighborhood on a large scale. Michael rolls with the change that pretends to work with Concha. Uh, she then asks Michael to kill his clients as eliminating Ernie will break the morale and resistance in the neighborhood. Michael convinces Ernie to be elsewhere during the attack. Concha's second in command, Diego, is more old school gangster who disagrees with Concha's brutal methods and long term goals. Michael convinces Diego that she has him marked for death. In desperation, Diego offers Michael a deal. He's willing to kill Concha, and in return, he'll turn over the neighborhood to Michael. Michael agrees, and the hit goes forward. With Concha dead and Michael apparently in control of the neighborhood, the villains are out of the picture for the foreseeable future, and the neighborhood is safe. With his blackmail on Bly in place, Michael refuses most of the reward from his client and walks away. I want to I pause before you go into this and go back to one thing for the pilot episode. Yeah. This show establishes that and this goes into our criminal bit, is that Michael is willing to do very bad things for good reasons, and he comments on that beforehand. And I want people to remember that the first pilot episode ends with Ray, with Ray Wise still getting like his uh, enormous amount of money. The thug, his uh, guard going to jail, and him giving yeah. a fraction, like a minuscule, maybe 1%, to Javier and his family to survive. Like that is how that story ends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now we can go here. I just want to establish no, that for a point coming up soon. No, that, 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 that is a good point because uh, uh, Burn Notice is really good about <clears throat> Pyrrhic endings, uh, Pyrrhic victories in a lot of times. Um, occasionally there'll be clean wins, but they're not, not every episode's gonna have a satisfactory ending. Generally, most of them have a, 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 a decent ending. Um, but you're right, Michael, sees himself as a bad person, does good things, and how other people see Michael is part of the interesting part of Burn Notice. Mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, but we have Jason Bly. Jason Bly is starts off as generic, sleazy government agent guy. And he is basically doing what's going to be kind of an ongoing trend of this season, which is government person tries to force Michael into a corner and that goes badly for said government person because you don't put Michael West in the corner. I thought, never mind. I'm, I'm not going to make a <laughs> yeah, I joke. set you up for that. I knew <laughs> Pavlovian response. Like, I put oh. <laughs> uh, and so this episode, the, the, the B plot is basically uh, Michael needs to do a thing against Bly. I need money to do it. I need to take another job. So we have the job. Go ahead. I just loved the start of the episode where we have them confronting each other in the coffee shop and he knows enough about the entire crew to know how they respond and mm -hmm. Fiona rolling up in a car full of weapons. And I think <laughs> I, I love Fee. Fee is my favorite character in this entire show. Hands down. I, regardless of, I, I, let me take back that back. I understand the additional context you provided that I didn't know before. Yeah, like yeah. I knew a little sure. bit about the RA, but not the American IRA relationship. Yeah. But from the how the characters presented, she is my favorite character on the show. No, I, I, I'm with you. Like she, I mean, um, well, to be fair, I, 
I, I genuinely struggle with my favorite character of the three core cast of, of Sam, Fee, and Michael. I mean, they're all fantastic. But Fee is great because she is not – she's she's not a simple character, but her goals no. are extremely clear. And anybody who has a basic understanding of Fee can pretty easily be played her because it's not the character she is, right? And so Bly sets up so the police catch her in a stolen vehicle with weapons in the trunk. And she does this because Fee always steals vehicles because she's not seen the reason to own a vehicle. And she has the <laughs> weapons because they were on sale. I loved it. Oh, I loved it so much. It was such and a so great Michael deal. Going, Michael just going, please, Fee, tell me this is insurance. She's like, but they were on sale. And it's like, on the one hand, it is the stereotypical man and ex-girlfriend fighting over her spending money but the context of it being around illegal weapons in a stolen car just makes it hysterical on top of she is constantly helping michael who has no resources and no weapons and she is the heavy so she needs those weapons to be able to do the things that he needs her to be able to do with him but he has no real way to give her money to get them so it's a beautiful cycle yeah (laughs) Something we don't see a ton of in these episodes I've chosen. Uh, I, I did get one slice of this. We'll talk about it later. But in general, um, one thing I actually do love about the show is that they do not shy away from putting Fee into actual physical fights. Yeah. And they do showcase her extremely well. So, like, you have this woman who's very petite who, after a few episodes, you genuinely believe she could beat the shit out of just about anybody. Um, part of it is because she does not fight fair. She was not trained to fight fair. She was trained to win. And so, yes, she is the heavy. But at first, it seems like the show is considering maybe it's funny. Like, oh, this very petite woman is, is, is the heavy. But like pretty quickly, the show just drops that. And it's like, no, no, no. She, we're going to paint her as scary as she actually is. Yes, Michael and Sam are also good fighters, but they fight in very different ways. Fiona is just a wrecking ball. If you if Fiona's involved in the situation, things people are going to die, things are going to blow up, and she needs resources to kill people and blow things up. And so occasionally that gets her into trouble, and that's where some of the fun of Fiona comes from because it's like Michael asked the question, Fee, please tell me there are not illegal weapons in the car. And on his face, you know that he knows the answer already (laughs) because we all know how Fiona works. I love it. (laughs) Uh, But anyway, so uh, he needs to get some cash together. And one of the things, again, I love about the show is that we get so used to the narration and Michael explaining his thought process that when he doesn't, it's genuinely good. Um, So all we know is he needs money to set up things fly put a pin in that because i want to come back to that but so it's like okay well he's cash he's gonna do this job and uh, uh so he works for ernie uh, and again we have another example of of to add additional additional context to the need for money and how little they have he took the job for javier for like four thousand six hundred dollars like right. that is the amount of money that we're talking about here and yeah. the rent for that apartment's like two hundred dollars a month. So when we're talking about money, if people are, if people didn't quite catch that, but that is a little little amounts of money that we're discussing. It's not like millions of dollars. It's thousands and hundreds of dollars. Like in which still, I take an extra couple of hundred bucks right now. But sure, yeah. but 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 that's a, that's just a good point because I mean I I, I slid over that when I talked about Fiona stealing cars because that's the scale we're at, right? Where Michael can't aff- Michael can't legally own a car, and even if he could, he can't afford it. He um, can't legally the- drive a car. Right. One of the subplots that I did not mention in the thing is that how- what Bly is putting over on Michael is offering him a he's offering him an actual identity. I will give you an identity. I will give you references. I give you a job, and it's at a bank. And Bly uses the opportunity to kind of put the, the- I'm going to give you a shitty, shitty job. But you need this because you have no other options, Bly thinks. Um, so that's kind of the tension of this is that Bly thinks he can give Mike basically a garbage identity and a garbage job, and Michael will have to take it. Uh. But yeah, it, it, it's, it's exceeding low stakes, which is why I made the Shadowrun comparison earlier is because it's the you – know, you you're, you're take cheap jobs with terrible people to make a buck because that's what you need yeah. to get through. And the, the – and, and so you have – Again, Michael fighting with a member of a secret organization to try to claim his identity 
coexisting with a guy who just wants to sell him and his friends to sell things without being harassed in Little Havana. And so the the scales are constantly being juxtaposed throughout this whole show. And I honestly feel like the small scale jobs are really the heart of the show because it's like, yes, Michael is fighting to try to reclaim. In this case, he's trying to get I, I, something over on Bly so that Bly doesn't try to screw him over. And he does this in the context of just helping a, sh a shop store owner out. Is 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 is, is I, I can't say enough about it. it it's 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 it, it. The show loses it in later seasons at one point. And it really is a detriment to the show. When the show becomes all about doing CIA stuff, it, it actually, I feel, hurts the show a lot. This is, for me, the sweet spot of the show. And you have, and it's reinforced here that Michael still doesn't necessarily want to be doing these jobs to help out other people. That's why he told Javier, mm -hmm. don't tell anyone. And when Ernie comes to him and says, hey, Javier, my buddy told me, he's like, fuck, Javier. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's the other thing. Again, we talked before, is like, the things that michael does in previous episodes have repercussions in future episodes because he's stuck in the same place he can't just hulk and leave the, the city right so yeah and javier's going that's oh, why i love this show i love yeah. consequences for actions and i love the fact that if you're somewhere like not all, consequences aren't always bad sometimes they no. are good like he's getting jobs for money that he needs but he's also has responsibility because all the he's only things for people who in some sense idealize him and want other people to know the great work he's done and he's constantly a fight and struggle for that because he doesn't want anyone to know he's doing it yeah it's like... and the other thing is uh, great about the show is that the first episodes it was basically pretty straightforward espionage stuff which is uh infiltrate situation get key information present the information to try to get someone to flip over that was basically the plot now we have a completely different tactic which is pure psychological warfare um michael just psychologically attacks the rival force um and another piece of this that i love I don't, i'm curious your thoughts on this is how he's juxtaposing military uh tactics with extremely low stakes small scale things so things like for example when guys show up in the car and he boxed them in he's talking about military maneuvering when he's really just shoving people in an alley and drilling holes into the hood of a car that context for me at least as a viewer is is amazing because it's like how michael constantly extrapolates his training into these bizarre situations i there isn't much i could say other than i'm in total agreement with you because it's a show of tactics what you lack in strength you have to make up for we go back to it in planning while he may mm -hmm. be shoving people in the into like the car to get them there he had to situate himself to be there so they would come so like that's forward thinking about what he has to do and then I don't know if Turpentine would set on fire how he's talking about, but <laughs> to be able to fast talk slash intimidate them, him with a bat and like a can, and they have guns Lighter, in a car yeah. to not do anything <laughs> like that is, oh, it is, it is very doctor-esque, if you would. You know, it's funny you say that. I, I think maybe all the reasons why I like this show is because I'm always gravitated towards heroes that use their brain as their primary weapon. Mm -hmm. And although this is a heavy action show, Michael is smart, and that really is his primary asset. And the show constantly reinforces that. It's not that Mike can Michael can kick your ass because he can. It's not that Michael. He's got can... Venetian Nikito. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. He he is he is the third Doctor in a different branch of the timeline. I'm just saying they both work for work for a shady government organization, technically as independent people. They're both super smart. They both know martial arts. Maybe the, the brig burned the third doctor and shoved him in Miami. <laughs> in, a, in a parallel earth, Michael Weston is a third doctor. See, this is what happens when Inferno, uh, it, it, the parallel universe for Inferno. <laughs> So, I mean, I'm kind of skimming through because, again, like this case where like the, the plot is just fun to watch and I'm going to talk about. I mean, his relationship with Concha and with Ernesto is actually really good. I want to take a beat, though, to talk about yeah, sorry. Concha because okay. that in of itself, God, 2007, I love seeing that 2007. And I'd forgotten about it even in this rewatch is that the vicious crime lord isn't like some old dude sitting back, but it is a like... Uh, a vicious crime lord that is a woman with a plan how technically her plan's bad 
like it's evil, that doesn't mean it wouldn't make that area better in the long run. Yeah. Like there is a duality to that that is very nice. So uh, then, like, that's... He's, he's helping the neighborhood. So short term, that's great. That's what we care about as people. Long term, potentially her plan may have helped the neighborhood more. That's a really good point is that with this episode seven, season one, and the show's already kind of course correcting. Like I think the show kind of maybe subconsciously, maybe unintentionally, but realized that if every episode was like the pilot, that could lead to long-term problems. And so, yeah, having the more of the diversity, because like there are three Cuban characters with strong speaking roles in this episode and nine or 10 total throughout the episode. And they're all different spectrums of it. Like, like Diego is the character you expect to be the crime lord, and Diego actually is yeah. a faithful, well, quote unquote, faithful, old <laughs> school person in, in command. And all three of them are different points of we want to make the neighborhood better. But they all have three irreconcilable opinions on how that should work. Yep. And it shows the morality of people and how, what extent they're willing to go to for what they believe in. Mm hmm. Yeah. And. Again, there's now now to keep Doctor references more of a seventh doctor planning style with Michael, where he has a bomb made. He tells Concha he's going to use the bomb to kill his clients, Ernie. He brings the bomb along, uses that to convince Diego that Concha wants to kill him, and then gives Diego the bomb to kill Concha with, right? And there's always again like some doctor there's always that how much of that was michael's plan and how much of that was improvisation on the spot <laughs> and you don't always entirely know and that's i think great because that's what michael is great episode and then to, to my earlier point is michael goes to the church ernie goes to pay uh, the rest of the money and like no, no no i just needed this to launder through a, a bank account i wasn't going to keep it except for expenses and then just gives all the money back. And on the one hand, like my, the first time when I when I, when I rewatched this, I was like, uh, oh, okay, Michael, that was all part of Michael's plan. But the more I thought about it, I realized no, because that had Michael's mm -hmm. plan. He wouldn't have mentioned the second half of the money. I think Michael changed yeah. his mind during the course of the mission. Yep. And it goes back to like these things are – making him more and more human and losing the cynical part mm -hmm. of him that he needed to do the independent contractor work. So like, that is a good character evolution to keep saying little by little. Right. Um, and then of course, uh, Michael has used that money to manufacture a, a, a chain of evidence to make it look like that Bly and Michael are actually working together. <laughs> and Michael uses blackmail on Bly to, contradict it and i'm realizing as i'm explaining this that i, I keep i keep getting um briscoe kennedy jr flashback because the villain yeah. is also called Bly. <laughs> yeah <laughs> could be his descendant maybe maybe uh, they, they certainly have the same kind of vibe so there we go we've linked doctor who burn notice and briscoe <laughs> county jr all into one universe done and the note with eddie before we move on in the gratitude that he has and saying he wants to tell everyone in the neighborhood. And again, you get Michael like trying to suppress his own reputation to like not help people. Please don't somewhat to an, like the 11th doctor where he's trying to do things without people knowing it's necessarily him doing it because his name is spreading too far. Yeah. And again, one thing is that I think this show works really well is that if this were a Michael Weston show the way Michael Weston wanted the show to be, it would be a lot like Danger Man or Sacred Age or something where he's going to different cities each week and, and doing cases. And so he has a bit of a mental blank in regards to the consequences of his actions. We talked about this earlier. So he's like, oh, no, I keep my reputation down because in his head, it's like eventually I'm just going to – I'm going to leave Miami and go back to my job or some version of it. And I will never have been here because that's, that's how I'm trained to act. And it just doesn't happen that way. So as, as, as skilled as Michael is, he doesn't get people because he's not trained to get people. <clears throat> Love it. I don't have any other thoughts on this one if you want to move on. Okay. Season two, episode 13, Bad Breaks. 
Sam harangues Michael for taking Barry to a fancy lunch in exchange for tracking a mysterious Cam and Banky Town. I have to pause here because we, we have forgot to talk about <laughs> Barry through all of this. <laughs> I do want to go back. Barry is amazing. Barry, I, I, I have straight up used Barry as a fixer in some of my Cyberpunk style games <laughs> because Barry is 100% a fixer. <laughs> That's going to be the thing. All right. When we're done, we're going to have to match everyone to what their uh, class would be, either in Shadowrun or Cyberpunk. Oh, well, absolutely. Absolutely. But the other thing I love about Barry is that Barry is gay. That is part of his character. It's not really relevant for a lot of his run until he has some episodes that you focus on Barry. And also, Barry's kind of sleazy, but he's always presented as kind of local business owner is always about this vibe, right? It's like, I, I, I got to make a little bit of money here, Michael. Oh my God. I've got to do you this favor, but please, you know, just, and, and so he, he, his demeanor is very, I provide a service to the community, even though his job is literally doing shady black market shit. <laughs> and it's such a great <laughs> intersection that I, it's hard to not fall in love with Barry immediately. He's such a great <laughs> character. Anyway, Barry starts reciting what he's doing for Michael Weston, breaking a lot of laws in particular. Michael realizes he's being taped, and during this, in walks Jason Bly. Bly recounts how thrilled he was to find Barry investigating suspicious accounts for Michael, and uh, as a result, thinks that Michael should negate the blackmail against Bly. Uh, in fact, Michael returns home to find Bly is leading a health department investigation for toxic mold <laughs> in his apartment. So Michael's forced to go stay with his mom, who has a friend with a problem. Paula, uh, his mom's friend, uh, met a guy named Prescott on the internet, and now she thinks she's being stalked by Prescott. Michael goes to the bank where Paula works, which is a privately owned bank, uh, and Bly turns, strolls in. Turns out he's not a stalker. He's a bank robber. Quick interruption. Mm -hmm. I want to add in that something that we haven't put in. I hate and love the fact that they put everyone's name, what their role is, <laughs> and how for... For Prescott, it changes from like stalker to bank robber. I love that comedic beat because it's something that started in the first episode and then it's used for comedy here. And yes. I assume it's happened before, but this is the time yes. we specifically see it. Love it. Go ahead. Yes. And again, it, 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 it reflects Michael's kind of analyzing people and then he updates his analysis. Yeah, it, it's a great moment. So uh, there's a lot of stuff that happens here. I'm going to go through it, but it's because it's, it's, it's actually kind of complicated. The bank robbers block cell phones with a jamming signal, uh, and they also pull out automatic weapons and, and herd the hostages into a conference room. Prescott tries to show that he's in charge, and so to do that, he shoots Bly in the arm. Uh, so Michael immediately pivots and pretends to be a doctor uh, and says he has to get tools to operate on Bly to remove the um, thing because if he dies, then I'll have dead hostages. That makes things worse for the robbers. The robbers agree. Michael uses the bank's Ethernet to boost a cell signal uh, and call Sam and Fee to help, have him come help out. I have no idea if that works. I assume it's bullshit, but it sounds good. Uh, Michael then sabotages an air hammer that the robbers are using to break into the vault and also drops some meds into one of the robbers' energy drinks. Outside the bank, Fee and Sam are bickering um, and because they're not on the same page because it was pulled together very quickly. Michael has been called to tend to the, uh, a man who tried to use an air hammer because the air hammer exploded and then went through his leg. Uh, Michael asks for liquid nitrogen to cauterize the wounds. When they give it to him, he also uses it to uh, hit Prescott's gun with liquid nitrogen. Prescott um, is finds out that one of the hostages is actually cutting through the wall with a pair of scissors. But Bly steps in and says it was actually really him. Prescott tries to shoot Bly, but then the gun explodes in his hand because of the liquid nitrogen. Michael says that Prescott is gushing arterial blood and needs a doctor to save his hand and possibly him. So Prescott tells his men to move the hostages downstairs into the vault. Michael sneaks his way back to the cell phone and calls Sam and Fee again to tell them the plan has changed. During this, while Fee's trying to get into the walkie-talkie frequency that the robbers use a cop pulls up and sophie causes a distraction with a cough vendor out front to get the cop to go away michael slips i stole a wrench during one of these altercations and slips it to Bly. he brings prescott meds to help with the pain um, and it's something that in small doses is relatively harmless but in large doses actually is very uh, lethal so he takes a, a pill to show Bly that it's safe 
Uh, meanwhile, the robber who's drank, guzzled the dosed energy drink, tells Michael he's feeling weird. Michael pulls him aside to check on him and uses that to choke him out and take his gun. Uh, so Michael now has a gun with one bullet in it. He tries to take on three armed men with it, but before he pulls the gun, Sam, who has during all of this, found the boat that they're going to escape in and got a hold of the walkie-talkie, grabs the robber and forces him to radio in, blaming that they're all dead and they don't know whose bank he stole. And Sam pretends to be some shady person who owns the bank and threatens to kill everyone. Uh, Mike immediately sells uh, the story uh, and tries to tell them that you know they're all going to be killed. Flies, uh, Bly uses a distraction to whack a robber and take a gun. Um, uh, and then during all of this, Fee uh, has set up the bomb so that when uh, Prescott is like, no, this is fine, and his men return on him, then the truck explodes, which attracts the police. The police show up and actually arrest all the bank robbers. And then after all of this, Michael and Bly sit down. Bly realizes that Michael could have had him killed at a point in time, so they, they settle their beef. Michael agrees to get rid of the blackmail information. Bly will shut down the inspection and take the heat off of um, Barry. Um, and then uh, Michael also asked to tra trace the bank account information they were looking to, and Bly reveals that the bank account was actually uh, fake and was a trap. And now that people Michael are looking to know that he's looking into them. So that's a lot. <laughs> and I could have just summarized that with <clears throat> Home Alone, bank shenanigans, and also the Bly situation was resolved. <laughs> But I didn't because this is one of the more technically complicated episodes because the A and B plot are completely entwined. Uh, the Bly subplot and the bank robbery subplot are completely interconnected. So there's really just one plot through all of this. But there's a lot of setting things up to pay off at different points of the episode. And while one thing's paying off, Michael's setting up the next thing that will pay off later. And the other option was I literally go through every single scene and what happens because there's I, I largely cut out the Fiona and Sam subplot because that's also happening through all of this. And so we have a show now in season two, middle of season two who's so confident they're going, we're going to take the A, B, and C plots and make them all completely interconnected. Because on top of all of this, we have the subplot of Michael's mom trying to use emotional leverage to get him to stay with her. And he ultimately agrees to at least have dinner with her, but he's, she's using her friend's problem to get Michael to emotionally support her. <laughs> and it's all connected. It's all interwoven, and it's it's a real high point for the show. And you have Sam and Fee's rivalry about who Michael yes. called first, and you have Sam giving up his dream woman to come help his buddy. <laughs> yes. To the point where, again, we have hilarious moments of Sam trying to track down the guy quietly and his girlfriend calls and he ultimately agrees that his life is too fast paced for her. And then he takes out his frustration on the guy he's trying to stalk. <laughs> you ruined something beautiful here. <laughs> it's 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 just incredible. And on top of it all, Mark Shepard playing the lead bank robber. <laughs> It, it is always good to see Mark Shepard. I'm surprised that he has never had his own show. I know. I really am too. Did you get a lot of diehard vibes from this episode too? Is that a real question that you're asking? <laughs> yeah, I'm actually asking. I did. I got strong. Yes. <laughs> it's like they watch Die Hard. It's like, you know what? Let's just do a Die Hard for TV. You've got like the bank robbers led by the the person with an accent that right. go in in a very similar manner. They're putting all the people in a little conference room together. I was waiting for um, <laughs> Michael to come out and say something like, ho, 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 I have a shotgun. I have a submachine <laughs> gun now. Right. Or to run across the floor barefoot. I was waiting for something like that to happen mm -hmm. that didn't occur. Yeah. I mean, because I I, I think it shows like enough identity to realize that that's not quite the character Michael is. But <laughs> just through his I was like, Someone, someone had to have watched Die Hard when they were writing this. I ha there has to be. This, 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 there's just too much here to make me think it's an unintentional. But also, I could see kind of almost accidentally falling into place. So, like, I'm not. I was like the whole time. I was like, is it? I don't know. Yes, yes, it was like blatant. I felt like they hit me in the head with a two by four. It was so Die Hard. 
Okay. All right. Then I, maybe I was overthinking it some. I did enjoy the touch, though, that he would also be a field medic just from the situations he's been in. Like that mm-hmm. was another little nod to the previous life and it came in and was useful. And it talked about how while he could do it, he wasn't the same amount of skilled. And so those are great little tidbits to keep adding in to show what his character sheet would look like. Right. Yeah. Um, also, to talk about what a slow burn, uh, burn notices. Mm. This episode is like more than a season away from the last episode we watched. And Bly does not show up between those two episodes as far as I know. So this is – there are lots of subplots happening, and sometimes they, they, they play a long game before they burn up. So Bly has been in the background vaguely threatening Michael for a long time. And, and they do a good job of really showing at the start that he's exactly the same Bly we saw last time. But then also that there's a depth and complexity there because Bly immediately starts trusting Michael when they're in the situation together. Well, it's a life and death situation, which changes how you interact mm-hmm. with people in general. If there's someone of a similar skill set and you're in the same situation together, you're probably inclined to try to work together to at least free yourselves. But it was also interesting to see that Michael cared about the people while Bly cared more about stopping the bad guys, which goes more into who they would be for personality wise. And so that was another nice touch. Yeah, I think what I think the reason why it worked really well, again, because they're watching this compressed format, you don't see as much, but Michael's had over a season of character growth. So when we saw them in the second episode we watched, they're roughly positioned as as equals, right? I mean, they're, they're both and they're both using the same tactics. Ultimately, they're both trying to use a folder of information to get them to comply. And it's the point where Mike's like, Oh, I have a different folder. I mean, that, it's it's very much played out that they're using similar tactics against each other. Michael has grown as a person, so now Mike, what we're seeing is what Michael was in early season one via Bly, and that's not what Michael season two actually would do. Because Michael season one probably would have tried to kill the bank robbers. Uh, so the fact that he immediately goes to how can we save these people, and the fact that he, again, Dr. Reference, he pretends to be a doctor. Yeah. He, he's not thinking of how I could, how I need to fight my way out of the situation, but how do I get them to disidentify them from doing this? Um, and, and there's an over, again, there's a, it's an over, or sorry, it's a voiceover thing, but it really sells it is that his goal is to try to make sure that all of the things he's doing actually is like bad luck. Um, and it's, it's wonderful because as much as I said, there's diehard vibes. It's also a little bit of home alone in terms of, getting people chasing around and running into all the traps he's set up with whatever's around. And you get the fact that Prescott is almost caught on to him by the end of the episode. Mm-hmm. Just from the looks he's giving him when he doesn't take the pills and makes Michael take them instead. Like you get that he's pieced a lot of it together and it's somehow related to that doctor. Yeah. And then luckily Sam comes in uh, and does, but, but again, like this is Michael, He's he's not he doesn't have a full plan. He's doing lots of very small plans in sequence. So he's constantly pivoting and changing and then putting in new plans in place with whatever information he currently has. So like the whole Sam pretending to be a, a villain was was very much improv. But yet how they present that is remember this operation and they talk about how it applies, shows that he and Sam worked together in this kind of capacity at some point in the past. So that past shared experience does a lot of heavy lifting. Agreed. I don't necessarily have a lot of other things. So the most of this episode is about the beats and the ingenuity that Michael kept showing as the plan changed. Right. The other thing I want to talk about is, this is more in episode two. Uh, I, I forgot to cut over it, but since... Uh, there are two Bly episodes. Is Fiona and Michael's relationship? It was in this episode because uh, Michael's like, as soon as I deal with Bly, you and I will have a talk and talk about a relationship. Or was it the last that episode? was the last episode because at the end of last step, I think. Now you've got me questioning it because right, I think Bly comes in at the end after they've had sex. Yeah, and he hands yeah, but... over. No, no, you're right. Does... This does touch on the fighting scene that we talked about because Michael slugs Fee when they're sort of fighting and tries Mm -hmm. to apologize and she still keeps going full full strength. 
Right, yeah. She and Michael fight, and we've seen Michael fight, and so he's obviously holding back, but Fee holds her own against Michael very, very well. But also, again, she is that blunt instrument. She's like, you promised me a thing. That thing is now, you know, if certain thing happens, that has now happens. I have a conversation. I just want to know where we stand. And Michael is just so incapable of giving a direct answer because that's not how he's trained. That's not how he thinks anymore. And he is like, just tell me. Um, and it's great because we see both sides of the argument. Right, like on the one hand, we see why Michael's had to constantly think and counter navigate and and go through these avenues, and so it's hard for him to just express himself honestly because he doesn't know how to do it. But also, Fee has every right to know where she stands in that relationship, and and Michael's genuinely in the wrong in this conversation. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, love right, because this is the episode where now we're at the point where. Sam has been crowing about how he was the first person that Michael called, and Michael had to admit Fee was the person I called, but I couldn't get a hold of her. So Sam will now be the first person I called. <laughs> <laughs> because you also get Bly's quip about Fee being in more clothes this time at the start of this episode. Yes, right, right, right. Okay, yes. Um, admittedly, the two Bly episodes do blur together a little bit, but I think it's to show strength that they blur together so well, and yet they're twenty some episodes apart from each other. The show and it, really keeps a strong stride throughout all of this. And they both have banks as part of their plot points, which is also an interesting That's thing. That's true. That's true. That's true. Hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I, I guess we're now moving to the to kind of the – do you have anything more about this episode or you know, the final thoughts? Final thoughts. All right. Um, what do you think about this show? I still enjoy Burn Notice. I'm, I'm going to say that it is – watchably good it is not a great show but it pulls off what it does incredibly well and it makes you want to come back and keep watching so well jill says it's cheesy i understand that perspective from someone that's not watching it intensely but just sort of like doing walk bys because it has that cheese vibe to it but the scripting and the acting are addicting and that is what television needs to be i i completely agree uh, I was glad to come back and rewatch this. I don't think I would ever sit down and watch all seven seasons again. Um, I, yeah. I don't think I'm that emotional investment, but it reminded me of what I loved about watching the show when I did. And, and you're right. Like if an episode came on randomly on television, I would probably sit down and watch it uh, because I know I'd be in for a good time and it'd be, oh, this is where they're at in their emotional beat. I remember that. It's also one of those shows where an investment in the characters really pays off. Like I said, um, without spoilers, Sam Axe is a genuinely tragic character, um, but you don't see that for a very, very long time. Um, why he drowns himself in alcohol and women becomes actually pretty apparent. Uh, and it's not an emotional turn I expected from fucking Bruce Campbell, right? <laughs> but it's there. Fiona, how she was done wrong is, is gen- both by the IRA and by Michael, frankly. Um, is, is, is heartbreaking. Everyone has had a horrible life uh, and Madeline just 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 wants her boys to love her and why is that so hard? <laughs> <laughs> but no, incredibly watchable. Oh. So what incredibly watchable thing are we going to do next week, Chris? Oh, so as we're, we're staying in this trend of sticking it to the man, <laughs> next week, Sorry, next episode, we're going to cover Leverage. And we're going to go Season 1, Episode 1, The Nigerian Job. Season 1, Episode 2, The Homecoming Job. And round it off with Season 1, Episode 13, The Second David Job. Uh, and speaking of tabletop role-playing and aesthetics, uh, John Rogers, uh, the showrunner for Leverage, is a well-known role-playing game fan. He actually even wrote the D&D, official D&D comic for a while for IDW. So cool. you're going to see a lot of role-playing game tropes in leverage when we watch this. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, so where people can find you online to buy your stuff? If you want, you can come to Dark Who Studios and buy a whole bunch of my stuff so that eventually I'll hopefully run out of it. And pretty much if you're looking to just talk to me, come into the Discord. I put out a new invite for it. I may put out another one soon. Uh, what about you? 
yeah, uh, honestly, just Discord, particularly Dr. Q Discord, is a great place to to find and chat with me. Um, uh, uh, right now, we're excitedly talking about the new Doctor Who, but we're not going to talk about the episode, the podcast yet, because we're talking about old Doctor Who right now. But we're also talking about new Doctor Who. It's very exciting. We're talking about if you want to buy new my who. stuff, new, new, new. Yeah, right. Yeah, there's old new Who and new, new Who and old old Who. Uh, who Who? Uh, is there a buy my stuff. <laughs> No. Oh, God. Do we need Dr. Seuss run now? <laughs> uh, yeah. Pug Steady. You know where to find it. I find my stuff. Blah, blah, blah. Realms of Pugmire. I'm not. I'm all thrown up now because now I'm thinking about Dr. Seuss. But we're not. Next week, we will talk about. Dr. Seuss. Leverage. Next week. <laughs> Goodbye.